Although I was hoping that once would be enough, I feel the need to cover this topic yet again. Now, I wasn't entirely sure if I was going to cover the material in these articles or not, since I already did a video on this in the past. But because these articles have some new and slightly different information, I figured it's going to be worth its own video, yet again. And that being said, if you hadn't seen my previous videos on reparations and slavery, I highly recommend you watch that first before watching this one. And the reason for that is I'm building upon the first video, plus I don't want to get too redundant here. I want to focus on some things that were not brought up before, and I also want to share with you some video clips here that are also going to expand on what I was saying before. Now, Fox News is not my favorite news source, but they have some relevant information to say either way. So the top of the article reads, A House hearing on reparations for slavery is set for next Wednesday, which marks the first time in more than a decade that the panel will consider slavery's quote-unquote continuing impact on the country and the next steps to quote-unquote restorative justice. And that is a mountain of BS if I ever smelled it. Because statistically speaking, black people were actually doing better in the 50s and even the early 60s. They were actually starting to catch up to white people in status and income, as well as intact families as well. And as a bonus, black women were actually more likely to be married than white women during those times. But now that we have Planned Parenthood, feminism, and the welfare state, all of that has just been for nothing. It's all gone. All that progress is gone. And there will never be another Black Wall Street until all three of those things are done away with for good. If you need an explanation as to why that is, I repeat, just watch my previous video, it explains everything. My point is that there is literally no evidence that suggests that slavery alone is what caused the downfall of the black community. Now, there is another article from Fox News where it talks about Cortez also saying that she wants to start to talk about reparations, and the Democrats are jumping on the bandwagon as usual. Now, I'm not going to read from this article, but there are videos on both of these articles that I wanted to bring to your attention. So I'm not going to go through the entire thing because most of it is just self-explanatory. And if you want to see the entire thing, just click the articles and watch the video for yourself. So here we go. 2020 Democratic presidential candidates say it's time to pay African-Americans for their ancestors suffering during slavery. Two words. With what? All right, let's see what they actually have to say about it. Facing criticism, Sanders got on board with studying it, but it's not clear how to do it. There is legislation, uh, as you know, in, in the House. And I have said that if the House and the Senate pass it, I will sign it. We should study it and see. One of the issues that is very clear is that trauma, years of trauma or even one experience with trauma can lead to lifelong consequences. I support the commission to study reparations. Uh, and when I'm president, I will sign that commission into law and get it started. Okay, so this is the part where I admit that I gave them way too much credit to begin with. So initially I was thinking that they're probably just going to cut every black person a check and just call it even. But now they're admitting that they don't know what they're going to do. One of them literally admitted that she has no idea what she's going to do about it, but she says that once the bill comes across her plate, that she's just going to pass it anyway. Yep, so the Democrats are like, okay, yeah, just, just vote for us, guys. Uh, we don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to figure it out. So once we get elected again, we're going to do it. We're going to finally get you guys reparations, and we're going to finally get you out of guys out of poverty. You know, it's going to be magic, but we're going to do it. We're going to do it together. It's literally the oldest political trick in the book. Candidate A promises this and that and this and that. Well, candidate B makes a bunch of promises also. Then the candidate finally gets in office and does whatever the hell they feel like. And like every election year that comes along, this happens and they fall for it hook, line, and sinker. Mayor Pete Buttigieg jumped at the opportunity to show he understands the African-American struggle. The conversation about reparations is also one of justice between generations. You can't, you can't tie that boat down and then wonder why it's getting flooded when the tide is rising. Now that was a terrible analogy, because even if you tie a boat down, when the tide rises, the boat floats with the water. That literally made no sense, and I don't even understand how that even fit the context of the conversation. If a boat starts to sink, that means it's got a hole in it, and it's a crappy boat. But speaking of justice, or should I say how the Pledge of Allegiance says it, 
liberty and justice for all, are we ever going to give justice to the Japanese who were put in concentration camps during World War II? And what about the Irish, who were also treated horribly for years and years and years? I mean, there were also Irish slaves too, maybe not to the extent of black slaves, but the Irish were oppressed nonetheless. But of course, they're not focusing on them because black people as a demographic are a much bigger voter base to target. Okay, so we're going to take a little break from all the honk, 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 and listen to what Shelby Steele has to say about this. We're pleased to be joined tonight by conservative author, documentary filmmaker, and senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and best-selling author Shelby Steele. Um, Shelby, we have so much to get into tonight, but I want to start with this reparations push. I mean, we just got through infanticide with Dinesh D'Souza and former Planned Parenthood clinic worker, and that's where the Democrats are on that issue. And now it looks like one after the other, they're going to come out for some type of reparations to, quote, resolve the issue of slavery. What's going on here? Well, I like the word resolve. Um, I, I, you know, unimaginable to me that you would have the hubris to think you could resolve slavery. Uh, and, and I think reparations generally is, uh, that's the problem with it. It's this holding on to an idea of justice that's absolutely impossible. Not only is it impossible, but it's self-defeating because you have to continue to see yourself as a victim waiting around in life to be resurrected by the, the beneficence of the larger society, by white guilt. And once again, you put your fate in the hands of other people rather than yourself. I would like very much to think that I have the self-esteem, the dignity to reject even the most lavish reparations. Um, I, I, I have too much racial pride to consider such a thing. Keep your reparations. Uh, I, I, will, I will fight like every other man in, in, in the world, every other person in the world, uh, to get ahead, to make progress. Uh, but to cling to this idea is, is shameful. So we already know how the Democrats like to exploit the victim complex of minorities, and especially in this case, black people, to manipulate them and gain their votes. But notice how he also brought up the fact that they are waiting on someone else to bring them up out of poverty, almost as if every white person that ever was owes you something for slavery. Now, I've talked about this a million times, waiting for someone else to come fix your problem or waiting for some charismatic leader to solve every issue that has been plaguing your life or whatever. If you have to wait for someone else to fix your problems, then you're going to be in a world of hurt for a long, long time, probably till you're dead. But quite frankly, that actually applies to everybody. So let's just move on. Let's talk about why and, and everything from the Oscars to college campuses that we've arrived at this place. Now, this is 50 years after the Civil Rights Act, all sorts of uh, progress made. We have uh, uh, black CEOs, uh, multimillionaires, top at universities, every aspect of life, we've seen great progress. So yet we're at a point where it's almost like there was no progress, there is no progress, and now white privilege, Shelby, is the, the rubric of the of the moment we've we've had this privilege issue percolating but now it's really taken root what you know what do both white people and black people do when they're stuck in this conversation it, it doesn't seem to go anywhere positive well uh, that's right it, it, it it's it's cyclical it doesn't uh, there's, there's no way out of it Let's look at a term I've dealt with a lot, and that's white guilt. Um, and white guilt is not the feeling of guilt. White guilt is acting guiltily uh, because you are terrorized by being seen as a racist. Um, if to be seen as a racist in American life is a, uh, a terrible thing, it's ruinous to your, your career, to your life. Um, and so whites then 
are hungry for a way to prove that they're innocent of racism, that they're not racist. And this is where the trouble begins. We've had 60 years now of the, the federal government and institutions across society bending over backwards, supposedly dealing with the problem of race and inequality and, and so forth. Um, and, and again, whites taking their position, liberalism itself really is a response to our, our history of evil racism. Liberalism is going to sort of redeem us from that. But the, you know, the problem with that is that you steal the thunder of the people you're trying to help. You, you cut them off from the, the human part of themselves that wants to aspire, that wants to make a life no matter what. The, the part that, that is fearless, that wants to engage the world. Um, so to satisfy this guilt, this larger de yeah. in society, we end up facilitating uh, weakness in the very people we're trying to help. Uh, Shelby, also, weak, I also, weaker and weaker. Yeah, uh, and, and he nailed it again. Because white guilt is just a shaming tactic that just puts the blame on somebody else rather than causing the person that is supposedly oppressed to look within for the answer and the solutions. So when your life sucks and you just go around blaming everybody else for your own failures, that means you are a loser. That is the very definition of a loser to me. And I don't know about you, but I got tired of being a loser. So what did I do? I started doing something differently. Differently than what I was doing before. Because doing the same old, same old that just gets you in the same mess that isn't going to help you at all. And that is exactly what the Democrats are counting on you to do. So there's one more segment of that video that I believe was very noteworthy and worth listening to. But I'm not going to comment on it, so I'm going to leave it at the end of the video for those that actually want to watch it. But before I finish saying what I want to say for this particular topic here, there's one more segment that I want to show you guys and then I'm going to respond to it. People aren't starting out on the same base in terms of their ability to succeed. And so we have got to, to recognize that and give people the, a lift up. So you are for some type of... Yes, I am. So I am by no means a fan of The Breakfast Club at all. But in this case, as much as I hate to say it, I think that she does have a point there. That there are some who do not have the same equal representation or the same opportunity as others do. Sadly, black people are included. Therefore, it brings me to this conclusion, is that there are modern day slaves but what are they slaves to? They are slaves to the Democrat Party. Willing slaves, I might add. And you know what? I am willing to give them some form of reparations, but not the kind of reparations you might think. So hear me out. So the left is constantly trying to paint white people in this bad light, saying that they are the reasons that black people and other minorities are oppressed. And because of that, we need to actually bring down white people so we can bring black people and other minorities up. But who are we going to actually subtract from? So to answer that, let me just start off with this. Remember when Lyndon B. Johnson had enacted affirmative action so that black people and other minorities could have easier time getting jobs and so forth? And so they could ultimately face less discrimination? Now, only two years after Lyndon B. Johnson made that a thing, the feminists came along, most notably the white feminists. They said, well, we as women want to be added too because, you know, we're oppressed and we want to be equally represented and yada, yada, yada. Even though we used to be on the other side of Jim Crow and we used to persecute black people too. But, you know, we're oppressed because vagina. We really need a leg up here. Besides, it was the white men that made us do it too. So not too long after that white women became the majority beneficiaries of affirmative action, more so than black people of any gender. So I've worked for a handful of Fortune 500 companies, and no, I'm not going to tell you exactly what they were because I don't want to dox myself, but if there's one thing I've noticed is that the majority of them have some sort of push for diversity in the workplace. And their idea of diversity is, whether they blatantly admit it or not, basically just hire more white women because everywhere I went 
they were always pushing for more women in this field and more women in that field. And who are the majority of the diversity hires? You guessed it, white women. Of course, there's minority women that get hired here and there. And of course, there's a lot more white women than there are minority women because white people are the majority. I admit that. But you don't ever see them pushing to hire more people of color. You don't see them pushing to hire more black people or people of Latin American descent or anything like that. But even then, they are still struggling to find qualified women to actually fill these positions when there are just tons of qualified men of all different races just willing to do anything to have a job. And even I learned as a qualified black man is that I have no chance of competing against a lesser qualified white woman. So I fully recommend taking white women off of the affirmative action clauses, especially since they haven't earned it, and actually make it exclusive to those who it was originally intended for black people and minorities. So that'd be a step in the right direction for equal representation in the workforce, right? Wait, wait, wait. You say I'm wrong? I can't do that? You mean I can't just take away the unearned privileges and unearned rights that white women actually stole from minorities that are actually supposed to help them get jobs and actually help them get equal representation in the workforce? My goodness, the system is really messed up, isn't it? Hypocrisy, it's everywhere. Okay, but all the sarcasm aside, the Democrats are once again trying to get as many voters as they can because they desperately want to beat Trump in 2020. And if they can't beat him in 2020, they want to steal the election in 2024. And yes, I'm not kidding when I say steal, because that's one thing they've been doing. Stealing elections via voter fraud. So that's all I wanted to say, and I will see you next time. Well, I think this is part of uh, this is part of the politics uh, of the left. Uh, liberalism has to have a menace to fight against to justify its claims on power. One of the things that they've obviously they, they don't have many real problems to work with today. We don't have the racism that we used to have, for example. Uh, what came along as a kind of gift to them was Donald Trump who could be built up into a huge menace. He is, like, he is an enemy of civilization itself, and we have to rally against him. We have to demand power in order to fight him. So Trump, in that sense, is the new racism. He justifies, without Trump, what do they have to fight against? Uh, racism has been pretty much nullified. Uh, and oh, they so, don't believe uh, that. So Shelby, the, the Shelby they don't believe that. No, no, they don't. You listen to Spike Lee at the Oscars, they, and we they, might as they well believe be that when they walk around the when they walk around the world, up and down the streets, and go into this place. I, I grew up in segregation. I know what what that's really like. Uh, that's not a problem today. You can do it. And go anywhere you want. You can be anything you want to be. Uh, and when you say that, when you say that Trump is a racist. You are simply going, you're regressing. That's retrograde. That's yesterday. That's not, that's not today. Uh, and, and you're not helping any. You just, the problem is that we, we have, as a people who were oppressed for three and a half centuries, we don't yet know how to deal with freedom. Freedom is far more of a problem in minority communities today than racism. Racism is that we, we're, we're calling back this old problem of racism to hide from our new problem of freedom. That's what we, we, we don't have a history that's a really of that. Interesting. Yeah, we that's had to really deal with everything, but not that. Yeah.